Hello, my name is Caroline Weiss. I'm a PhD student at the Machine Learning and Computational Biology Lab of ETH Zurich. I present topological and kernel-based microbial phenotype prediction from Malditov mass spectra. This paper is joint work with several members from our lab and also the University Hospital Basel. I'll start by introducing the data type we're using, Malditov mass spectra. Malditov mass spectrometry was designed for the analysis of large molecules, such as proteins and peptides, and is used to characterize bacterial samples. The samples, so the whole bacterial cells, for example, are fragmented and the masses of these fragments are depicted in the spectrum, where the x-axis shows the mass to charge ratio and the respective measured intensity is shown on the y-axis. The spectra give an overview of the microbial composition and are very characteristic for the microbial species, for example. In fact, they are so characteristic that Malitov is a standard tool to identify the species of a microbe nowadays. So to identify which bacterium is responsible for the, the infection of a patient in the clinic, for example. As Malitov spectra capture the microbial composition, several research directions explore the prediction of microbial properties using machine learning. So for one, even though species identification is highly accurate, further research is going into the distinction of some bacterial subspecies that cannot be fully determined from Malitov spectra yet. In this paper, we focus on a second characteristic to be predicted, namely antimicrobial resistance. While some of efforts have been made to apply existing machine learning methods for resistance prediction, no method um, has been specifically designed for the use on Malitov mass spectrometry. None of the methods include confidence estimates, which we argue are critical for the um, applicability in the clinic. And none go into a fine-grained analysis of how pre-processing of the data uh, or of the spectra will influence prediction results. To illustrate how resistance prediction for Malitov mass spectra could be implemented into and benefit the patient treatment, I want to look at the processes how, process of how infections are characterized and treated in the clinic. We start at the time of sample collection. Um, after a uh, waiting time, so culturing period of 12 to 24 hours, the Malditov mass spectra is obtained and thereby the species is identified. Based on the species, an antimicrobial resistant as resistance assay is ordered which can take up to 72 hours more of waiting time. From the assay, the resistance is determined and a specified antimicrobial treatment is, ad is administered. During the wait time, broadband antibiotics with unknown efficacy are used. We envision a prediction method that can reliably predict antimicrobial resistance from mildly to spectra already and that can provide guidance to an effective antimicrobial treatment without further waiting time, and that reduces the use of broadband and ineffective antibiotics. Before any machine learning can be applied, the spectra need to be pre-processed, so some technical artifacts um, need to be removed, and uh, the spectra need to be put into a format that can be used uh, for a machine learning algorithm. So um, the steps are that the uh, spectra is pre-processed and then the peaks are called. So the peaks are identified from the spectra. There is a quite extensive and commonly used pre-processing uh, procedure in the literature, which includes about seven steps and numerous um, method and parameter choices. Um, this is often done using commercial software or this open source um, R package, MultiQuant. Um, these uh, steps and parameter choices are never really justified in the literature. So no information is given of um, how these parameter choices influence the predictive performance. In our paper, we propose a p-calling algorithm based on the concept of persistence from computational, bio, uh, computational topology. It reduces the p-calling and the pre-processing down to one step with only one parameter, which is the number of peaks to keep. In the paper, we compare the classification performances with both um, pre-processing and p-calling methods. 
we obtain mixed results with both um, pre-processing methods reaching superior performances on different scenarios. So in the interest of time, I'll keep this part short, but please refer to the paper for more details on the method and the results. But we do conclude uh, that the choice on how um, to pre-process the multi spectra heavily influences the prediction results. And we encourage further research in that direction. Um, in both cases, the goal of pre-processing um, is to detect the peaks. Um, if the subsequent machine learning classifier requires a vector of fixed um, length, the peaks need to be distributed into linearly spaced um, bins in the binning step. So in the end, um, the goal would be to have a reliable antimicrobial resistance classifier, which also gives useful confidence estimate for clinical applicability. For this task we, task, we designed a new kernel, or we developed a new kernel, specifically designed to fit the properties of multi tof mass spectra, which we named PIKE, the Peak Information Kernel. So given two spectra S and S prime, uh, with mass charge values xi and xi prime and intensities lambda i and lambda i prime, the closed form approximation of the inner product takes this form. Um, our pi kernel was inspired by the heat diffusion e equation. And in it, every peak in S is compared with every other peak for S prime. Their peak intensities are multiplied and weighted by this exponential function. And the further away, um, the two peaks are from one another, this, uh, this weight is smaller. I want to point out some properties of the pi kernel. Um, first, the similarity is calculated directly on the peak, um, which are defined through the mass to charge and intensity value. So the spinning step I um, just talked about becomes obsolete when using our pi kernel. Even more, it uses a more accurate representation because we don't, by, by up, um, by not doing the binning step, the x values are not altered. Um, and we, we can use the, x, the more accurate x values directly. I also want to point out that the kernel can handle sparse representations of multi tos spectra, and spectra, the input spectra can have different cardinalities, therefore. Secondly, um, the kernel is capable of assessing interactions between peaks because all peak combinations are uh, to some extent compared to one another. Um, it is important uh, for multi of mass spectra as some biological, fra biological fragments can be detected in different locations along the x-axis as the x-axis shows the mass to charge ratio and not just the mass. Additionally, for our kernel, solely a single parameter needs to be optimized, T, which controls the degree of smoothing in the kernel. Smoothing works as a normalization and controls the influence of single peaks. And because it can regulate the influence of small peaks, T implicitly works as a noise reduction on multi tos spectra, where very small peaks are often due to noise. Finally, we combine the Pi kernel with the Gaussian process to obtain our method, GP Pike. As Pike is um, differentiable, we can optimize T through a continuous hyperparameter search through a gradient descent method. We can also find the best model of our several train test splits by taking the mean of all the best T values. This illustration um, shows the influence that the smoothing parameter has on the feature map of a spectrum. So when T is approximately zero, we have um, a random a raw spectrum represented by a sum of Dirac functions. But with increasing T, the Dirac functions get diffused and the spectrum becomes more smoother. Thereby, T controls the influence of single peaks. And due to the large T's on the effect of large T's on small peaks, um, the smoothing works as a noise reduction for the multi tos spectra, where small peaks are often due to noise in the detector. For the uh, machine learning analysis, we are working with a data set provided by the University Hospital of Basel. The spectra and their resistance profiles were collected in the clinical routine of 2018. The data set includes three different species, E. coli, Klebsiella, and Staph aureus. Um, all of these three species have been named priority pathogens for antimicrobial resistance by the WHO. 
For each species, we investigate three antibiotics, which are commonly prescribed for infections with these species, resulting in nine different classification scenarios. We define a binary classification scenario, where we define the positive class as the resistance class and the negative class as the susceptible class. In most cases, the positive class is in the minority, with between 10 and 30% of samples being resistant. But we have one case where the resistant class is in the majority, in fact. Um, we compared the performance of our GP Pike method to two other classifiers. First, the logistic regression, which is commonly used in Malditov based machine learning, and a Gaussian process with a, a different and more established kernel, namely the RBF kernel. And we report the average precision values to account for the strong class imbalances I just showed you in the data set. And as you can see, for each of the nine scenarios, we achieve superior performance with our GP Pike method. We saw it as critical for the clinical applicability that we are able to judge the confidence of our model predictions. First, I want to argue that due to the nature of the prediction task, confidence estimates are indispensable. A resistance predictor applied in the clinic will be presented with out of distribution samples, such as strains newly introduced into the local population through traveling, for example, or if strains acquire many changes over time, which can affect their resistance and become too dissimilar to the training population. As a confidence estimate, we use the maximum class probability from both the shown classifiers, logistic regression and Gaussian processes. As the prediction task is binary, by taking the larger class probability, we obtain a probability value between 0 0.5 and 1. So we wanted to analyze um, the behavior of the maximum class probability when the classifier is presented with samples from within and outside the training distribution. Um, as a dummy for outside the training distribution samples, we used samples from the other two species that we did not train the classifier on. So um, all, scenario, uh, all uh, plots shown on here in the slide uh, correspond to the same scenario, namely Staph aureus, um, a resistance to amoxicillin clavulanic acid. And um, on the left, we show logistic regression, and on the right, we show um, the behavior for our GP Pike. And each plot shows a histogram with um, the maximum class probabilities from 0 0.5 to 1, and the bars indicating how many of the test samples were assigned that value. So here in the first line in green, we show um, test samples that are actually in distribution. So um, the classifier was trained on Staph aureus samples and we tested on Staph aureus samples. We look at the logistic regression. Um, we see that the test samples are assigned pretty much all values from 0 0.5 to 1, but there's a clear skew towards um, large probability values, so values close to 1. When we present the logistic regression with samples from outside the training distribution, so from the other two species, we see that all samples get assigned very high class probabilities, even though these samples are from another distribution and the logistic regression cannot possibly know their resistance profile. Um, we explain this behavior with the linear decision boundary of the binary logistic regression classifier. Unknown samples or out of distribution samples lie at a different location in the feature space and the training and the training samples. Um, therefore, they lie can possibly lie very far away from the decision boundary, and as a consequence, they will give, be given a high class probability, even though no reliable prediction can be made. Unfortunately, this behavior means that the class probabilities are not suitable to report model confidence of unknown samples um, in the case of logistic regression. Um, let's look uh, uh, on the right to our GP-PIKE method. 
here for the in-training distribution samples, um, also all values from 0 0.5 to 1 get assigned, but they're much more evenly distributed. And more importantly, when we pr present our classifier with samples that are outside the training distribution, the class probabilities drop and only values, or almost only values um, smaller than 0 0.7 are assigned. So the classifier seems to recognize its own incapability to classify these samples from a completely different distribution and adjusts its reported probabilities. This behavior is caused by the non-linear decision boundary of a, uh, of a Gaussian process. And this permits us to give a proper probabilistic classification of unseen samples. So while the, the confidence estimates are able to detect samples from outside the training distribution, we can also use the confidence estimates to improve prediction on samples that are in training distribution. So the idea would be to take um, the maximum class probability um, and then reject samples with a probability less than this threshold. And we would expect that the performance on the remaining samples gets better and better the stricter the threshold is set. So this is what we did here. Um, we go through um, all rejection thresholds from 0 0.5 to 1 and plot the accuracy of the respective um, classifier. So in uh, the dashed line, we see the logistic regression classifier. Um, for smaller rejection thresholds, it shows the behavior that we expect and it shows an increasing performance. But once the rejection threshold reaches values very close to one, the performance drops drastically. We, yeah, we again uh, explain this behavior with the linear decision boundary that even in the training distribution, we have samples that somehow lie very far away from the, from the uh, linear decision boundary and therefore receive high probability values. In solid, we see um, our GP Pike method, and here um, our method follows the um, expected behavior, almost exclusively increasing in performance and finally reaching an accuracy of one. So, to conclude, we present a novel approach for antimicrobial resistance classification for mild heat of mass spectra. Our, uh, our novel kernel, Pike, is specifically designed for Malitov mass spectrum. And in combination with a Gaussian process classifier, Pike outperforms the methods traditionally used for Malitov mass, Malitov machine learning. By being able to provide um, reliable uncertainty estimates for its predictions, We provide our Pi kernel as a Python package um, under this um, GitHub address here. And finally, I want to thank my co-authors, Max and Bastian, Karsten, Aline, and Adrian for their uh, feedback and support. And with that, I would like to conclude. If you have any questions that we cannot address in the question time, please don't ha hesitate to contact me per email and thank you for your attention. <laughs>